I uh, just want to start by saying good afternoon and welcome everyone to our community check-in on art, mental health, healing, and wellness. I want to let you all know that we have closed caption services turned on for the Zoom today, and you can use them by clicking on the CC at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we, if you have questions or comments during today's check-in, please feel free to put them in the comment section or the Q&A box, and we have staff members on the team who will respond or float them to our panelists. We're very excited to have you all join us today for our conversation on art, mental health, healing, and wellness. Um, as some of you may know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I think it's safe to say that we've all had a difficult past year and a half, and uh, we want this hour to be a safe space where everyone can talk about how art brings them joy, and we can share resources to refill our collective cups. My name is Ricardo Guillaume. I am a program officer in the Community Initiative at the Mass Cultural Council. Today, I'm calling from Hyde Park, Boston, which was originally the land of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag tribes. I'm a Haitian American black man with short black hair, a black beard, black glasses, black polo shirt, and brown skin. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm here today with our wonderful panelists, whom we'll introduce shortly, and also my co-host, Veronica Ramirez Martel, who will introduce herself, the team, and our speakers. With that, I'll give it to V. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Ricky, I don't see it in full screen. Can you make the presentation full screen, please? Uh, yes, sorry about that. Um, while that happens, hi, my name is Veronica Ramirez Martel. You can call me V. Um, I am calling in from Jamaica Plain in Boston, Massachusetts land of Massachusetts and Pawtucket. Um, I am a Puerto Rican woman wearing a red dress, red glasses. I have shoulder length, almost <laughs> dark brown hair. Um, and you see many plants surrounding me in the background and a lot of light. Um, I would love to present our team, which is all here right now, I believe. We are the communities team. Lisa Simmons is our program manager. Luis Cotto is the cultural districts program manager and also um, addresses some um, local culture council, same with Lisa. And then program officers, we have Mina Kim, Timothy FM, Ricardo Guillaume, and myself. Today we'll have a few different speakers. Can we move forward with the slide, please? Thank you. Um, we'll have Erin Genia, Samia Ali, and from our own Creative Youth Development Department, Eric Holmgren and Keita Swaba. Um, we'll be starting right now with what we're doing now and looking at the agenda. Erin Genia will be starting us off. Can we look at the agenda, please? Or is there no, there you go, yeah. Great, so right now we're doing some initial introductions as an icebreaker um, throughout the event today. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to share a moment of, of healing and re-energizing or, you know, positive feelings that you've had through arts and culture. Um, and we'll ask that our panelists do that as they start presenting. Um, so for, I'll share one really quickly. I'm working on a cross stitch. So you'll see me doing that as we're going through the meeting, but believe me, I am listening and very engaged. Um, and it's, it's a great thing to do and it helps connect with people. So without further ado, I would like to present, um, Erin Genia is joining us today. Hello. It's really good to be here today. I um, uh, first want to say that I've been having some technical difficulties, so I did have a presentation that I wanted to share with you, but it's my computer is not cooperating with me. So I'm joining you from my iPad and I don't have the presentation with me, but I will just walk you through um, my talk today without any visuals. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today and um, it really is an honor to be present with you in this moment in these times. And um, I wanted to also thank uh, Ricky and Veronica for your support um, to bring me here. 
Erin Genia Makiapi. My name is Erin Genia. I am a Dakota person. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapakan Oyate. And our tribe is located on the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. My pronouns are she, her. I currently reside on the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people and within the territory of the Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples. Um, my, for access, my, um, I am a Native American woman um, with light skin. I have dark hair and dark eyes. I'm wearing a yellow shirt with some pink and purple patterns. And I'm sitting in front of a map um, behind me. So I am really excited today to present the work that I've been doing um, pretty much over the past year, starting in March of last year um, as an artist in residence for the city of Boston. And specifically, I have been working with the Office of Emergency Management and the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. And I've developed a multi-level framework called Cultural Emergency Response. And I wish I had um, the videos um, for you to share. I'm actually gonna try to pull that up here while I'm talking. Um, so if you'll just bear with me. So I will just start off by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, my perspective, I should say. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Dakota person, as I mentioned. I've been working for many, many years as a community organizer and a cultural worker. And it is from the, this perspective that I perceive that the United States is in a state of cultural emergency. Um, I also see that as a society, we don't recognize that. And because of that, we don't have a way to deal with it. So I feel that in really in order to um, address the deep seated issues that we are facing together, that we have to shift our understanding and address them from a cultural lens. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to pull up my screen here. Thank you for your patience. So as one who is really inside and outside of American culture simultaneously, um, I hail from peoples who have been targeted for destruction by the dominant society. And this has really given me a deep perspective to see these harms that are caused by American institutions and systems. And I know that I'm not alone in that. Um, but I also believe that these harms should not be considered inevitable or acceptable. I feel that with each passing day, this evidence that we are in a state of cultural emergency is mounting and people from so many walks of life are demanding change. But even with this level of crisis, our society is resistant to altering its trajectory. So with this project that I've been working on, cultural emergency response, I am asking, how long can or should we go on accepting the harms that our culture produces? So just to give you a little bit of a context here, I just started my residency with the city um, when the pandemic hit. And working with, within the Office of Emergency Management, I witnessed them spring into action to deal with this major public health crisis. And, um, you know, I really had an opportunity to see how emergency management works behind the scenes um, with the office, all of the different offices, the, the public health um, department, with the mayor's office, with every different office to marshal funding, to um, provide resources and um, people power to rapidly fix issues. Um, every contingency that they can think of is planned for and they strategize and they um, try to figure out what will be needed to plan for an emergency, to what ne is needed during an emergency and what is needed after an emergency to recover from it. So, you know, as a longtime community organizer, I really felt that um, this is the kind of effort that we need to address major societal emergencies like climate change, institutional racism, economic inequality, health disparities, ecological destruction, and in particular what is an issue that I work on 
um, this indigenous people's dispossession. These, all of these issues are tied together through culture. And instead of superficial fixes, that we, we really should be focused on looking at the root cultural causes of those. For example, climate change um, is rooted in the dominant culture's philosophy that views the earth and its systems primarily as resources to extract and profit from. That's very different from the perspective that I bring um, as a Dakota person, because that is um, sort of antithetical to what Dakota people or how our culture has developed over thousands of years. Um, so, you know, I, I started to think like, well, how could I really operationalize something like this? Um, and the first part of that begins with defining what is culture. I work in the field of arts and culture and a lot of emphasis is placed on arts and not as much is placed on culture in terms of culture being in sort of the larger sense of the collective practices that are embedded in the daily rituals of our lives. It is our culture that determines how our society functions. The ideologies and the philosophies that drive our culture determine how our economic, political, social systems are established and how they continue to operate. So those same doctrines that fuel societal progress can also create harm for so many people and lead to disasters in the long run. And, um, you know, always kind of coming back to my experience as a community worker, over the years I've faced burnout a lot. And what I found is that in my work with social movements, whether that was with in anti-war movements or um, economic justice, um, indigenous people's issues, um, racial justice, um, I found that our communities were kind of automatically and subconsciously continuing to uphold philosophies that contribute to and cause the very same injustices that we are fighting against. So I, over the pandemic, had a lot of time in my residency to like really think about what are those philosophical constructs that are so central to our culture. And so I'll just share with you what I've come up with, and I don't believe this is an exhaustive list, but it has helped me um, a lot to, to be able to do this work and to share this work. So um, I would start by saying that um, toxic individuality and the separation from the natural world and others, the separation of ourselves from the natural world and others is a problem. Our hierarchical and binary thinking and authoritarianism Misogyny and toxic masculinity, short-term thinking, idealizing greed and consumerism, violence as a tool, coercion through brute force and fear of dispossession, Western cultural supremacy and assimilation, historical amnesia, competition over cooperation, wastefulness and the squandering of energy, resources, and labor, cultural appropriation, undervaluing youth, elders, and the extended family. And so, I wanted to read those to you today, but there's actually a lot more that I've put on my um, webpage, which is housed on the boston.gov site. And um, I would like to share that with you in the chat. Um, and I'm, I'm coming to you on my iPad, so I'm usually on my laptop and it's much easier for me to do that. So I think I will do that after my talk. Um, so, so those are, some of the things that I've been working with in the residency and um, really been thinking about how these cultural norms have emerged from the imperial philosophies of Western European colonization and really a trajectory all the way back through to the Ro to Roman times. Um, and they're so rooted in the fact that this country is a settler colonial state that gained its wealth, its economic wealth and its political power from genocide and land theft, slavery and war. And, you know, I really was thinking about this a lot that Boston is an epicenter of colonization for this continent. So what is our responsibility for those of us who um, live here, who work here? What is our responsibility to that legacy? 
And I, I also feel that there's a lot of potential for our community to address this. Um, so some of the things that I've been working on some, you know, I've, I've created this like kind of theoretical framework that you can access on the boston.gov website. And then there's, I've been doing some other things too, some more tangible things and working in the community, stuff like that. And um, last year I uh, organized a series of three panels um, called Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Space. And this was happening um, around the time when monuments were coming under intense scrutiny. Um, the Black Lives Matter protests and movement um, were, were happening and many people were, you know, looking at these monuments that uphold settler colonial myths in our society and uh, demanding that they be removed and that conversations were happening around these, these things. So, um, oh, thank you for the time. Um, and so I, um, I organized these panels that were uh, hosting a series of, there were three of them, and then within them um, were indigenous people from our community, uh, leaders, artists, community workers, and allies who um, spoke about how uh, the, the public health emergency of racism has affected them as native people and how that, how that has uh, been perpetuated through the monuments and the kind of the public landscape of, of the city of Boston. And so you can view those um, also on the boston.gov site. So, so that was something I did last year. And then over the past, year I have been kind of expanding on this idea of cultural emergency response and um, at the end of my um, um, res I'm at the end of my residency now and over the past couple of months I've been working on this project that is cultural emergency kit giveaway uh, which is based on a Dakota uh, practice of giveaways and um, what it is is that people from the community nominate somebody who they consider to be a cultural emergency first responder. So these are folks who are like essential workers and teachers, community organizers and cultural workers. Those people who are filling in the gaps that our society you know, is not um, addressing. And so I received many nominations from people all across the city just doing some incredible work uh, for people. And I am in the process now of putting the kits together, assembling the kits. They, inside of the kits, they will get some wellness items, art items, um, a cultural emergency manual that I've made. Um, and the, a lot of the products that are inside of the kits are made by Native American businesses. Um, so, so that has been a really, um, it's been a really enlightening project for me to to be a part of um and i've also made i've made other art um, artifacts and things too from um creating a fully beaded dakota style emergency vest which i cannot show you the picture of unfortunately um and then also doing things like um using the uh, using emergency management techniques for example emergency management trainings to um, really talk about and unpack some of these issues surrounding the, our philosophical and cultural norms. Um, I did a cultural emergency response training called Realizing Relationality and um, through, through Water. So those are just some of the things that I've been working on. And um, thank you so much for your patience today. Uh, and it's really an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and you know, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you're doing. We shared, uh, Lise has been sharing the links of what you've been mentioning throughout your conversation. Oh, sorry, and Ricardo, so don't worry about having to share that later. And we will also be sending a follow-up email to everyone here with all the links and all the things that we've been mentioning so that you have something to refer to and you can focus right now on being present and, um, in community. So thank you so much, Erin. 
Um, now, next we have uh, Samaya. So, Samaya will be um, talking for the next 10 minutes, and I'll just send a little reminder when we're getting close to 10 minutes. Okay, so stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, B and Aaron. It was so great hearing all of your work and just um, hearing more about Indigenous people and the work that they're doing. So thank you so much for all of that. But um, my name is Samaya. My pronouns are she, they. I'm currently a student at um, Simmons University, finishing up my degree in sociology. Um, I've been making art for about like six years now, at least like painting very physically. But I've been very creative and expressive, like even as a young child, I think um, like I want to speak a bit about what art making means to me and that creative expression, because I feel that a lot of people will, um, they will like grab a paintbrush and they'll be like, oh, I could never do this or I could never be an artist. But I, I genuinely believe that we are all artists because um, to me, what creating art is, is like just sharing a story or sharing an expression. So one of my mentors, whenever I um, share a painting with him and I'm like, can I have some feedback or some critique on this? He just says like, well, what tone are you trying to convey? Like what message are you trying to get across? So uh, to me, that's really what art making is about as well as sharing a specific message. So um, I also like do a range of mediums. So you can see like one of my paintings in the back right now. So I primarily work with like acrylic painting but I also do writing, um, videography, like even a little bit of music production because it's really about expression and about um, sharing a story that like is very unique to you, but also something um, that we can all like find ourselves grounded in. So lately I've been trying to explore how to, um, I've been thinking about like cities and like just metropolitan areas and thinking about how um, a city is like so specific like you can walk down the street but at the same time you're part of this like larger neighborhood this larger state this larger town etc so on and so forth so I've been trying to like convey both um the feeling of like being really really large in the world and connecting all of that even if it's like energetically to being connected to others as well as like um being very grounded and present to the point where you can like you're in some way aware of like the cells in your body. So for me, um, like my process of creating has been very, it's been very um, cathartic, I would say. Um, and I also like to um, like explore my emotions through my artwork. So there's this like one Basquiat quote that I always think about. So he um, said, I think he was in an interview and he was saying like, um, when I'm, painting and when I'm creating I don't think about painting I think about life so I find that very true for myself as well like I'll find my good painting days or like the days where I feel like I'm making like the best forms of art is when I'm just like letting my paintbrush in my hand just like operate on autopilot and where I'm actually just like processing other things that I've dealt with in my life so if I'm like feeling scatterbrained or if I'm feeling like um I'm not grounded, I'm not present in my body. I will just like work through that in my head and I will just like continue to process that. And um, it's very therapeutic, obviously. like of course, as I've mentioned before. Um, so in my work, I'm guided, as I mentioned, I'm a sociology student. So that entails me to um, study like a lot of different scholars. So I'm primarily guided by um, black feminist scholarships. And one of the tenants in black feminist scholarship is um, standpoint epistemology and another tenet is lived experience. So those two are a bit different, but they're very similar. So standpoint epistemology talks about um, the fact that, well, epistemology is a way of knowing, it's how you know something. So standpoint epistemology talks about the fact that a person who experiences a certain phenomenon that's like either related to race or certain identity, they are the ones who are at the center of the solution for that phenomenon. So for example, if we're talking about like um, a, a black woman who's dealing with like mass incarceration, she would be the one that would offer you the best solutions on how to deal with that particularly. So lived experience is a bit different and it's um, actually very similar at the same time because it talks about like you being an expert in your own lived experience. Because a lot of the time what happens um, due to like white supremacy and like um, Western cultural norms is that 
we like to pretend that there is um, a barrier between your emotions, your experience, and what you actually are bringing to the table. So when I was in high school, they would um, mention like, don't ever use the word I or we in your papers because it makes it personal. It takes away from the validity of what you're saying or the truthfulness of what you're saying. So in my work and just in my life, I like to do the opposite. I think the fact that you are rooted in this presence and the fact that you are rooted in this experience makes all the difference because I would rather you talk to me about what you experience than um, try to deprive your humanity of that and try to take away your identity or even just the way that you're experiencing the certain thing. So I work with a couple of, um, oh, and I'm also influenced by my ancestors and just um, that ancestral lineage as well and trying to um, always connect to a pre-colonial um, process of creation. So also looking at um, what labor means. So considering how, um, in this capitalist world, like we're very much exploited for our physical body and our labor. So I was talking to my friend and he was mentioning like, even though you enjoy making art, it's still work because you are like looking for it to pay your bills if you're like a professional artist. So I want to um, just like recognize where labor can actually be positive and it can be like, um, like that to like being in community and doing labor for your community. So there's different sense of that like when you're doing labor for your community and labor that you actually want to do, whether it's like um, like sweeping a shared space, cleaning up a shared space, um, holding physical space for your person to like, um, to allow themselves to like process emotions, just listening with compassion and like deep intent. That can all be labor, but that's not labor that gets exploited, you know? So that's also something that I, um, I'm exploring a lot. But like I was saying, the communities I work with are primarily um, immigrant communities, so Black and Brown first-generation immigrants. Um, I've been teaching like high school youth who are um, predominantly immigrants. So a lot of um, Black and Brown immigrant youth, so Somali youth, I'm Somali myself, so it's been great to um, actually be able to connect with them on that level of like heritage and background, as well as um, Dominican, Guatemalan, um, El Salvador, Asian. So from Vietnam, from China, um, from Bangladesh. So a very diverse group of youth. And it's been so amazing to do the work. What we do is um, we have arts and activism workshops. So I will be leading them through like, um, like through historical movements that are art related and that are related to resistance as well. And even current movements. And then they also learn how to paint. So I try to like teach them on the more technical stuff like color theory and um, color theory, like how to set up a composition, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think like what I've enjoyed doing about that is what I've enjoyed doing, ugh, words, what I've enjoyed about that and doing it is that um, like, I actually, it's so cliche, but I learn a lot more from them and I learn how to just like be a more compassionate person and just how to actually listen and be present because we've been doing it on Zoom for the past summer and the past school year. So it's been very exhausting. So I think um, like, of, like while they learn from me, I also learned from them on how to just like take it easy and to not like be so like strict and like um, making everything about a finished product. It's much more about the process and about um, using painting as like a lifeline to actually like help you through whatever you're going through. And my final thoughts is I just want to um, acknowledge that joy is resistance, especially as marginalized people, our very happiness and our very excitement and us just actually being happy to be awake, that is a form of resistance itself. And I think that's um, what I've been trying to curate even more in my art. I've been trying to step away so much from um, talking about like the brutality of white supremacy, even though it is important to talk about that. I think it can be overwhelming for me since it's something that I do a lot. So I wanna talk about the moments where I feel joy admits all of that and where I can actually practice like um, self-care and loving myself and my community. So thank you so much. I'm excited for today's talk. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, that was great. So now we're gonna be hearing from Keita Swabak and Eric Holmgren from our Creative Youth Development Department. Thanks for having us, V. Sumeya is one of nine founding members of the Creative Youth Development BIPOC Alumni Council. 
Um, she's been working with us just since about February. And since February, I have learned that I should never follow her when she speaks because it's very hard to live up to the, um, the kind of insights and thoughtfulness that she brings to everything she does, um, including her artwork. Um, in the creative youth development team, we fund um, and support currently 73 different programs throughout the Commonwealth that really infuse um, excellence in the arts, sciences, and humanities with principles of youth development. They're essentially organizations that are at various stages of learning to listen to young people um, and to really take um, with them the, the assets that young people bring to art making, to their communities, to the organization. Um, and at Mass Cultural Council, um, we're taking steps to do that now with this pilot program that Sumeya is a part of. Um, all of these programs, I think during the, during the pandemic specifically, um, what really shone through for these organizations was a pivot to becoming that trusted community partner for essential human services in their communities. It was really hard to make art. Um, it, it, at a certain point, art became second or third or fourth because folks had immediate needs when the pandemic hit. Um, these organizations have trusted partners in um, housing and mental health, physical health, um, you know, families and individuals suffering from food insecurity. And so we saw this amazing transformation on a dime for, from so many of these programs um, to being that essential sort of conduit for services that, that young people and families needed. At the same time, they continued to try to reach out and they continued to try to work with young people. Um, I think the story of the pandemic has yet to be told. Um, and the more that we're listening and seeing and, and experiencing the art that young people are creating, um, the more we're gonna really understand the strength and the resilience that um, I think is, is coming out and, and is something that um, won't be ignored um, in the future. Uh, it, it's tremendous what we've heard from this community. Um, not long after the pandemic hit, we uh, started convening um, as many organizations as would join us um, on Thursdays, not because we had any sort of expertise in what to do with creative youth development during a pandemic, but we knew that the solutions to shared problems were in that space and that folks could in real time um, share some of the learning and some of the struggles that they had. And, and those convenings continue now. Um, and, and all of you are welcome to join on, on Thursdays. Um, one of the other programs that we run um, really grew out of this work in creative youth development where we were seeing this, this incredible capacity of the arts um, to, to be a powerful force in the lives of young people, um, but it doesn't end with young people. And I think all of us know that. And we started thinking about this concept of creative human development and it led us to this really rich connection between the arts and health. Um, and what we're doing now with the arts and health is um, working to support partnerships around Massachusetts between professional care providers, whether they're medical doctors, pediatricians, therapists, um, you know, you name it with cultural organizations so that patients can actually receive prescriptions for theater and prescriptions for museums and prescriptions for, um, in one circumstance, uh, folks with Parkinson's um, being able to work with their vanity dance. Um, it's built on this idea that, that um, we know that someone's zip code has more to do with their health than their genetic code does. Uh, and we can affect so many of the things that are in and around their communities. And especially here in Massachusetts, we have such a deep connection and a, and a rich ecosystem of artistic opportunities that these partnerships are the beginning of what we hope is a, is a longer engagement um, between the arts and health. Um, and, and so I think these are all programs that are, are sort of meeting folks where they're at and recognizing and leveraging the arts as this incredible capacity for individual community and public health and, and also to begin to tell the stories um, of young people, especially during the, the pandemic. Um, and, and I'm kind of excited to see what those stories and how they're told in the next few months. Um, I'll turn things over to Kate so she can give a little more context and detail to some of the work we're doing um, and provide some resources um, for everyone here in, in this area. Kate. Hi, everyone. <sighs> I feel like we just want to take a deep breath for a second and shake things off a little. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by two things. One, you know, Aaron, I so appreciated hearing 
um, all that you are doing. And I think I, I'm sort of held with two different things. One thing that Aaron talks about, which is the culture emer emergency responsiveness and how important it is like to be able to see like, yeah, there is a lot that needs to be responded to. And then I also hear Samea, you know, joy is a resistance and how do we, um, you know, in the words of uh, Audrey Lord, being able to, you know, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. You know, caring for self is, is so important. Um, you know, in working with creative youth development and in Culture RX, um, everything that Eric was just talking about is, you know, how do we really work with understanding how the arts and mental health can really feed each other and do so many good things. You know, we have, I think, over 40 years now of the arts and health field really talking about how art experiences can improve mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Um, but, you know, it's really only in these last, you know, five years or so that the, the articulation around exactly how that's done is, is there. Um, I think you're kind of matched with this other element, and this is where I think about the culture emergency. You know, we have suicide that continues to be the second leading cause of death among those ages 15 to 29. Um, increased rates of suicide also, I mean, if you look in history, you know, after the 1918 Spanish flu, as well as after the SARS outbreak, in 2003, suicide rates increase. You know, I think a lot of CYD organizations are also prepping for the amount of mental health that they're going to be really needing to attend to. Um, you know, and I think, you know, to what Aaron was saying and also Samea, you know, how do we look at these things differently? How do we really shake things up a bit to say, yes, you know, in Aaron's word about this, you know, toxic individuality. It, it's not, you know, identity needs to be redefined. Identity is not just one single self apart from the rest. Rather, it's identity that's honoring the complexity, that's dynamic, relational, containing multiple identities where gender, sexual orientation, race, class, ethnicity, you know, all of those are greatly also affected by systemic injustices. And this complexity needs to be honored. Um, and better understood and articulated as we speak about health and well-being. One of the things I'll put in the chat is um, people may know about the Lewis Prize, the Accelerator Awards. They've done a beautiful job right now really trying to define uh, what does system change mean? Why is it important that creative youth development organizations start to really look at this? Um, because, you know, so much of it is it's so directly affects identity and identity of our young people um, and the well-being to, you know, Eric's point, I think it's 55% of our health is actually, you know, non-genetic aspects. So this is about where you live, what you're experiencing, what you're eating, you know, all these different things in which we actually have some, some control over in some extent, you know, especially as, as we help to define or redefine what really culture is. Um, now to Samaya, I just was thinking about these, it's a beautiful thing where they talk about um, what, here, hold on, let me grab this, you know, what really helps? And I think that CYD organizations do these things so well. Um, but finally, we're having some definitions of what does it mean to be a creative, healthy community? And, uh, you know, Public health is really identifying these five different factors and some of these things just haven't been named as clearly before. So I'm gonna put one thing in the chat too. This report I think is so important where we identify collective trauma, racism, social isolation, mental health and chronic disease as being priority health issues um, for our cultures. And I think that, um, you know, if we look at like in research, they talk about uh, recovery processes. What is recovery? And this, just for one more little list, um, let's see, you know, how do we, you know, as, especially as we redefine identity, you know, but how, how can we make more ways for connectedness, for feelings of meaning in this life, hope and optimism? That only comes when you're really able to directly look at the systemic injustices that have really happened and that you're actively working to change those. And the empowerment, I think, I think what's what's helpful is that a lot of these terms are being redefined and empowerment from the 1980s is not the same as what is empowerment now, largely because exactly what Samaya was talking about, all that she's studying in school 
you know, from these different perspectives that really are much more um, culturally inclusive and a lot more able to look at what the truth is in our country and how supremacy really has impacted so much of our systems. But again, I think the joy to to that I feel, and um, I had to put my painting in the background because I'm really an abstract painter, but part of it is like really like, okay, how do you branch out and really do things and sit with yourself and have that those moments of um, reflection and courage to try something new and the ability to really connect with nature, all those things I think help so much in our processes of, uh, of yeah, just trying to deeply connect when things want to, to separate and pull apart. That's about all I have to say. Thank you, Keita and Eric. And that's a beautiful segue. So we can now open it up to everyone else that is here. If anyone would like to share a moment of, of healing, of re-energizing, of, of, you know, taking care of yourself and, and finding joy. Um, so anyone that would like to participate, otherwise, after some sharing, I think we can open it to general questions or discussions that anyone might want to present um, to any of the speakers or anyone else within the room. I'm happy to talk for a second. I just, Martha just actually um, invited me in and I couldn't be more thrilled about that because as you were all talking, it's like, I literally just got home from the hospital. I've been there since Sunday. I am a nurse um, taking care of two chronically, I have a relationship with chronic illness, two kids with um, inflammatory autoimmune disease. And I left the ICU after 20 years to take care of my own and then found out that I too have something going on. Um, and so when you talk about some of these things, I have found that I'm like Tim Ingold and I walk a lot and I, uh, Samia's talk is literally the last paper I submitted because I'm going to Leslie for my MFA and I'm doing that because I wanna be a multidisciplinary person making change because I feel that we are the maker, the tool and the body of work and that we are the masterpiece. So I want to, I, I was in the hospital as a patient but I was seeing with my own eyes what needs to be changed because the system is broken. Our world is unsustainable and people need accessibility more than ever. In art, I find as I make, I have these diagrams that I'm happy to share with you as I drew them in the hospital, um, I, I figured it out. Like this overlap, when you put the three circles, there's a sweet spot in the middle and that's where art comes in. And that's the portal to everything, a way of knowing the world. Um, and, and, uh, and it is an overlap with it's, it's the closest thing I've understood to faith. I feel like we're, we are all uh, team members and we don't know each other, but we know we're there. And so when I came on here and heard you talking, it's synchronicity. It's literally the words that I wrote in my paper. So I just, I have goosebumps and I'm so excited to hear what you said. And I, so as a, a, as a professional nurse, as a patient, as an artist and someone who, I know that I'm already a living memory. I'm not going to see the world that I want to create, but I do want to be part of this conversation because I believe this is the key to changing medicine and changing people. I, I was thinking in the hospital, we need to change the M and me to a W for we, and we need to, uh, that's the key to it too, um, because we're stronger together. Like they have been saying, with COVID. With COVID, there was an awareness that got built um, that was missing before because I was already living the COVID lifestyle for years in isolation without being able to tap into certain things with my family. And then I didn't feel as alone, even though I was alone, because everyone was living my world and the world became more accessible for my family, oddly enough. There is a silver lining and it's the conceptual framework, it's all context. What is the framework we're putting around our big picture that we're gonna put out there as the masterpiece? And it's like, if we just shift our thinking and we are creative workers, we can uh, change the way the broken things are. So thank you for doing this and being just change makers. And that is, 
I'm just amazed. So this is the best thing that obviously happened to me. And I, didn't, I haven't slept much in 40 hours, but thank you. This is outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Does anyone want to respond or <laughs> go and share with the, with the rest of the room? Maureen, I saw you wrote something in the uh, in the chat. Do you want to talk about it? I do because I came here today not knowing that the, the topic we've been dealing with for the last year as cancer survivors is what you're talking about. Um, I, I joined our interpretive, um, our innovative healing sessions at our cancer center as a patient. And we had intuitive painting. Um, I was an artist, studied art, and then got caught in the corporate world and advertising. And I didn't think that my art and creativity would be a healing therapy and useful until I went to this class. We had to turn it to Zoom classes um, last March. And then over the summer, the um, facilitator met Nicole Antiel um, and she wrote a book, Satori Circles. So now, um, as we're coming into the class, they mail out this book to us, and I'll show it. I don't know if my screen. My, I'm having trouble with the lightness and darkness, so I'm not seeing how dark it is in my office here. But this is the title, and it's templates, and it's a good springboard for anyone going through anything to just quickly make a mandala, make a doodle. But these are kind of little things you can come up with if it's black and white. Um, I've been doing it for weeks now and adding color. You can see you just, she plays music and does like a, a breathing exercise at the beginning. And we all just listen to her music and spend an hour drawing. So it can be pencil, which I'll show you that. <laughs> I didn't know what was going to be show and tell today, but we have the class every Tuesday and it's just, we've been pulling more cancer survivors into it because it was too intimidating being called an intuitive painting class. So I asked her to change it to creative healing. So she just made that change to the name and other people are opening up to it and saying, well, I can use crayons. I, you know, kids can do that. And they're actually talking about the different, you know, tools they're using and you know they'll look they'll say how they're feeling that day and then at the end of it they'll look at their work and say oh i got that out of my system <laughs> so just real quickly i just wanted to share that um satori circles is something the berkshire um medical center cancer center is using um, as a tool for survivors for dealing with ptsd which is kind of new for people to learn that that's what cancer survivors have to deal with. Um, I didn't realize it my first round and then the second round people were talking about it and openly and the anxiety of each test and each visit was what was creeping up. So I've just found it, I've been sharing it with family and friends, you know, this past year because of where we're at and just saying it's a great springboard if you're stuck creatively to just get something on paper and then it could start for something you know get you to another level um or just people that aren't artistic they find that they can be just by putting a line on a piece of paper and repeating it and it can be a group event you can have one person draw on the next person so it could be a family fun thing <laughs> thank you so that's, yeah that's my contribution there thank you so much and it's really nice to see you <laughs> I wanted to say that too. <laughs> um, we have about 10 minutes left together. Um, and I also want to mention that if anyone feels more comfortable participating through the chat, you're welcome to write there. Um, I noticed someone, I just remember someone asked earlier if the chat is safe. I don't think so. Can someone confirm that? Um, 
but yeah. and all the links. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So we will, so don't worry about taking notes right now. Be present, you know, enjoy, enjoy the community that we're in right now. This is beautiful to, you know, be able to, to witness and see all that is encompassed, you know, within our arts and culture and our everyday and how we feel and how our bodies feel. And we've heard some sharing of work that we need to do and we'll continue doing for the rest of our lives and hope that the fruit is, you know, enjoyed by our descendants. Um, and we've also had the experience of seeing people's faces light up as they talk about beautiful moments that they've had. Um, and this is a space where you can share both because we insist, exist in both and even one event can be both a silver lining and you know, totally harrowing. So I just want to thank you all for being here, for sharing your stories, for being present, for allowing us to share ours. Um, and I'm going to take a, a step back now and leave space for anyone else that wants to share. Thank you. Well, I'm going to jump back in, and if no one has anything to share, I think that we can culminate now, and I invite you all to, if you're, like, in a place with nice weather, because I know it varies, it's really hot here, it's sunny, the sky is blue, so if you have a chance, go outside and enjoy the beautiful almost summer weather that we're experiencing today, at least in the Boston area. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.